Hi and welcome to a new episode of Wissenschaft fürs Wohnzimmer or Sitting Room Science. It's that you tuned in. And today I'm really excited that we have Martha with us and she's a PhD candidate at the Max Planck Institute for Neurobiology and Behavior. And we will dive with her into the topic of navigation in Earth's magnetic fields. And I'm really excited for this. But before I hand over to Martha, we will also quickly introduce ourselves. So I'm Jana, I'm working at the Helmholtz Institute for Functional Marine Biodiversity in Oldenburg in the group of biodiversity theory. And I'm looking into advancing our understanding of the, bio, of the diversity and the dynamics of marine bacterial communities. And with this, I hand over to Stefan. Hi everyone, also from me, this is our English episode. So we'd let you know if you have questions, put them in the chat. That's where I think. Um, and my, uh, my name is Stefan Jurike. I'm working um, at the Alfred Wegener Institute in Bremerhaven and also at the Jakobs University in Bremen. And I'm a climate researcher and doing ocean modeling on supercomputers for predicting how the ocean currents change in the future and now. And with that, I would like to forward to Matthias. Yeah, just a quick hello also from me. I'm Matthias Wietz. I'm from the Alfred Wegener Institute as well. Also looking at bacteria, mostly in the Arctic, so a little bit related to what uh, Jana is doing. Uh, but I won't say much more. I'm a uh, marine biology by training, so also interested in larger animals. So I'm really excited also to hear more about not the smallest organisms in the oceans, but some larger organisms. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, yeah, have fun with Martha's talk. Thank you. Um, we will have a little bit of small organisms as well. <laughs> so yes, thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm really excited to be here. And I actually did my master's in, um, in Bremen at the University of Bremen. So some of my courses were at the AVI or with AVI faculty. I'm a big fan of the Institute. Um, yes, so I will share my screen. Here we go. Interactive. Yes, so I am interested in understanding how animals take information from their environments and how they use it. Whether we mean to or not, humans affect animal behavior, which can lead to problems, especially for endangered species or threatened species. That means that in order to prevent the potential effects by radio towers or wind farms, for example, we need to know how animals sense the, um, their environment and uh, perceive it. So here you see our beautiful planet, which produces its own magnetic field, kind of like a bar magnet does. It even has a magnetic north and south pole, like a magnet. And how animals can sense and use the Earth's magnetic field is one of the most um, exciting open questions left in sensory biology. So today I'd like to introduce you to what magnetoreception is, how we think it works, and how it is being researched in behavioral experiments with animals. A well-known example of a threatened species is this sea turtle. So these animals travel very long distances and have fascinated us for ages. Loggerhead sea turtles hatch on land on the North American coast, make a sprint for the ocean, and then start a long swim that loops across the Atlantic Ocean. And the adults eventually return to the same beach where they were born to lay their own eggs. For a while, scientists assumed that these turtles just kind of drifted along with the currents, which also follow this um, similar circle pattern. But it turns out that drifting by itself would not keep the turtles on track. Now we even know that turtles use Earth's magnetic field to actively navigate. But because sea turtles are protected, it is difficult to study exactly how their magnetoreception works. The good news is that other kinds of animals also use Earth's magnetic field. So maybe we can use what we find out about the, uh, these other animals when we are considering turtles. So first, we're going to look at the characteristics of Earth's magnetic field that animals might use. Then we'll get into the three big hypotheses about how magnetoreception works. And we will spend most of our focus on behavioral experiment examples with birds, sharks, and mole rats. 
before at the end returning to how um, this information might help us think about Turk. So as I mentioned, our planet naturally produces a magnetic field. And this is actually crucial to life on Earth because it protects us from harmful radiation from the sun, for example. Magnetism comes from movement of electrical charges. So the rotation of the outer core near the center of our planet in orange here causes electrical charges to exit at the south pole and enter at the north pole. This motion of electrical charges is represented by arrows in this picture. And that is what I am referring to when I talk about magnetic field Earth. This magnetic field has several characteristics. The declination angle, describes the difference between the physical North Pole of our planet and the magnetic North Pole. So they're slightly separated. And intensity is how strong the magnetic field is. So where these lines get closer together, the field is stronger. When they're farther apart, it's weaker. Inclination is the angle at which the magnetic field enters or leaves Earth's surface. So if you're at the North Pole, the magnetic North Pole, the inclination angle is positive 90 degrees because the field enters the Earth at a 90 degree angle. And if you're at the equator, it's zero degrees because it's parallel, it's not going in or out. Using these characteristics, an animal moving across a surface can tell either where it is, like reading a map, or what direction it's going in, like reading a compass, or both, and also be both. So far, we have three likely explanations for how an animal is able to sense the magnetic field. Radical pair, induction, and magnetite-based hypotheses. The radical pair mechanism would be light dependent and respond to the inclination angle of the Earth's magnetic field. The induction mechanism requires liquid and an ability to sense electrical charge differences. So this is actually an indirect way of sensing the magnetic field, but we'll get into that later. And the magnetite-based mechanism depends on iron particles inside the organism that act kind of like a compass needle. So here we have an example of a bacterium with um, a magnetite chain made of iron inside it. So now I'm going to show you some behavioral evidence in three different animals, one for each of these ideas. And we'll start with the radical pair mechanism. So a lot of research has been done in migratory birds, such as the European robin. Um, and by the way, you don't need to worry about what this name means specifically. In one of the earliest studies, the Wilchkos used an eight-sided cage to test how these robins orient under different magnetic field conditions. So each side of the cage had a little perch for the animal being tested to land on as it moved around. The cage was positioned inside magnetic coils, which the authors used to change the magnetic field. And the two characteristics they changed were the inclination angle and the polarity, so where north is along, around the circle. But first they tested the birds under the natural local magnetic field, so they didn't change anything. And this kind of plot you'll be seeing a lot. It basically looks like a compass with the cardinal directions. And these small black triangles around the edge are um, one, in, one average direction for each individual bird that was tested. But this one at the center is the average direction for all of the birds. As long as it crosses at least one of the circles inside, it is a significant result in what we would consider real. So under the natural magnetic field, we can say that these birds oriented um, to the northeast on average and preferred to sit up here. As I switch slides, please pay attention to the polarity and the inclination. So when the authors reverse the polarity so that the magnetic north pole was located at the opposite side of the cage, the birds followed and still oriented to the magnetic northeast. Now I'm switching slides again. When the authors kept the natural polarity, but flipped the inclination angle, the birds oriented in the opposite direction of uh, where they had been in the natural magnetic field. So this was the first big clue for these authors that inclination 
angle was more important to the birds than polarity. When the authors inverted both polarity and inclination, the birds also oriented opposite of their behavior in the natural field. Finally, the authors decided to set the inclination angle to zero. And we can see that birds suddenly randomly oriented. So this little uh, arrow in the middle doesn't even come close to crossing the inner circle. So that the vertical information from the inclination angle, they could no longer use the magnetic field to orient. And that altogether allowed the Wilchkos to conclude that these birds use inclination angle instead of polarity. In 2001, the same authors um, demonstrated that the orientation of European robins changes depending on the color of light they are exposed to. Under blue, turquoise, and green light, the birds were oriented in their regular migratory directions, but under yellow light, they were completely disoriented. So with that clue, we have the two main points that support the radical pair hypothesis, that it's light dependent and responding to the inclination. But what would the radical pair mechanism look like in the animal? So recent studies suggest that a particular kind of protein is necessary. And one take is that this might work in the eye. So as light enters the eye, the inclination angle of the field, um, these gray arrows, could interact with light sensitive proteins distributed at different locations across the back of the eye. If that's the case, the animal might actually see the magnetic field as a pattern across its vision, these little light areas, for example. So that pattern would change as the animal moves, which would give it a reference for orientation and navigation. And that's the radical pair hypothesis so far. Most of the research has been done with birds, which is why I used them here. But ongoing studies show that birds might actually use all three of these hypotheses. Since the induction hypothesis was originally proposed for sharks and stingrays, though I'll be um, presenting some evidence from sharks. First of all, though, I should introduce what induction means. So that word refers to the fact that when you bring a magnet close to a conductor, such as a regular loop of copper wire, um, which by itself is not magnetic, Electrical charges inside the copper will begin to move and create an, uh, a magnetic field. Similarly, if we pretend that this loop is a magnet and this is a regular piece of copper, bringing um, the copper through the magnetic field will induce charges to move along the copper. So now I want you to pretend that the shark is a piece of copper. <laughs> the idea behind the induction hypothesis for sharks is that swimming through a magnetic field should induce the current of electric charges along its body as it's moving. Sharks live in salt water, which is conductive of electricity, and they are known to have an electroreceptor system in their skin. So that means they can sense electrical charges. So sensing the charges along its body could allow a shark to know how the magnetic field intensity is changing as it swims. The amount of induction depends on two things, the speed of the shark and the intensity of the magnetic field. A study in 2017 with sandbar sharks tried to show whether sharks do in fact use the induction mechanism. So they kept um, seven sharks in a circular tank surrounded by coils of copper wire and trained the sharks to swim over a target, um, but only when the coils were turned on by running electricity through them. And they received food when they did that. But when the coils were turned off, the sharks were just exposed to the natural um, local magnetic field. Oh gosh, sorry. Uh, yes. So once the sharks were trained, the scientists compared how many times sharks swam over the target when the coils were on versus when they were off. And they found a massive difference on the bottom axis of these graphs, we have time, and the red indicates when the coils were turned on, while gray is when they were turned off. Up here, we have the median number of times that the sharks swam over the target, and down here, the mean or the average. 
But in both cases, you can tell that sharks much more frequently swam over the target when the coils were on than when they were off. With this, the authors implied that the sharks were responding to the artificial magnetic field created by the coils. But this by itself still would not tell us whether sharks use the induction mechanism. So the next step was um, to attach magnets, actually, to the nose holes of the sharks and repeat the experiment. So the magnets are these little hats on their noses. They did this because um, earlier studies found iron to be present in the noses of certain fish. So if that iron was somehow involved in magnetoreception, a magnet should interfere with how the iron moved, which would interfere with the magnetic sense. For a while, scientists thought that an induction-based mechanism, on the other hand, should not be affected by the presence of magnets. Unfortunately, uh, an important biophysics paper from 2009 shows that this is not true. So this paper presented a bunch of mathematics that demonstrate a magnet would actually interfere with an induction-based mechanism unless it moves less than 100 micrometers within the electrosensory uh, system. 100 micrometers is really tiny. <laughs> much smaller than the shark's electrosensory system. So this is just an illustration of a shark's head from above and from below. And these lines and dots represent the electrosensory system, which is basically a network of jelly-filled um, pits and canals in the skin that lead to little bundles of sensory tissue. You can see that this system definitely reaches further than the end of those magnets, which would have been sitting around here. Also, a shark swims in a wave-like motion, more or less. And the electrosensory system is not only on the shark's head, but also along its body. So if you attach a strong magnet way over here on its head and an electroreceptor, one of those sensory bundles, is over here on its body, a lot of movement can happen in between the two points. So we need to come up with a better way to test whether sharks use the induction mechanism. This is the least studied hypothesis of the three, so there's still a lot to be done. Uh, yeah, and if you have any ideas, we'll be very excited to hear them. <laughs> Unfortunately, many shark species like sea turtles are threatened or endangered, um, which makes studying them tricky. But I just mentioned that some fish are known to have iron in their noses, and that has led some people to suggest they use a magnetite mechanism. The magnetite hypothesis came from observing bacteria. Um, so we know that some bacteria build magnetite chains out of iron in order to use this magnetic field. This is one bacterium, as we saw before, and the line of white dots inside it is a chain of magnets. Now I'm going to show you a video of these special bacteria moving inside a drop of water under the microscope. And off the bottom of your screen, I am holding a bar magnet uh, that I'm flipping between the two poles. So when the bacteria change direction, you know I've switched the direction of the magnet. This is just the edge of the water drop. So now they're gathering at the water drop edge and now they're changing direction again. So the logical question is, um, can other animals also sense polarity like these bacteria do? And the perfect animals for that question are mole rats. This is the kind of animal that I work with in the Malkemper lab. Um, mole rats are rodents about the size of hamsters, and they live in tunnels underground that can stretch up to 2,000 meters long. So the main tunnel is also pretty much straight, and it's just fascinating to think about how these animals know where they are digging um, in the complete darkness without any other cues. They also show a very useful behavior in the lab. Um, so when you put a mole rat into a circular arena with a bunch of tissue paper, pardon my artistic skills, <laughs> and just leave it alone to do its thing, um, the, the mole rat will gather up that tissue paper and build a nest. And the nest is usually next to the wall of the arena. 
It's also usually located in roughly the same location in the southeast. So Heinrich Berda and his friends noticed this and decided to see what would happen to the location of these nests when the mole rats were exposed to different magnetic fields. They used magnetic coils again to change the magnetic field similar to the bird study. First, they tested the mole rats in the natural field. Um, and as I just mentioned, the mole rats spontaneously built their nests in the southeast direction. Now I'm going to switch sides. I want you to please watch the mole rats and the magnetic north direction. So when the authors rotated magnetic north to be pointing in the southwest direction, the mole rat nest um, rotated the same amount so that it was still located in the magnetic southeast. And now I'm switching again. When the authors rotated magnetic north to be in the complete opposite side of the arena from um, the natural field, the mole rats still built their nests in the magnetic southeast. So the authors elegantly showed that mole rats orient using a polarity compass, which is evidence for um, a magnetite based hypothesis. So I already showed you the bacteria, but you might be wondering what on earth this magnetite mechanism could look like inside a bigger animal. So here's one possibility. Now we're on the single cellular level. Um, so this is a receptor cell, which would be the first cell to respond to the magnetic field. It's somewhere inside the animal, we don't know where. And in order for a receptor cell to communicate with other cells in the nervous system, positive charges from the outside have to cross into the cell and excite it somehow. There are gates in the membrane of this hypothetical cell that can let positive charges through, but only if the gates are open. So our magnetite chain is um, attached to that gate and in magnetite, uh, magnetic field A, the gate is closed. But if magnetic north is rotated in field B, the magnetite chain will be pulled and open the gate, which will let the positive charges into the cell and excite the cell to start a signal moving toward the brain, um, letting the animal know that the magnetic field has changed. Of course, it's possible that the magnetite is not actually a chain, <laughs> so there are different um, shapes it could take, but uh, the concept is similar for how it would have to open the gate. So with that, we have explored um, the three main hypotheses about how magnetoreception works, the radical pair mechanism responding to inclination angle, the induction mechanism requiring movement of the animal and responding to intensity, and the magnetite mechanism, which responds to polarity. It is possible that a given type of animal um, uses more than one of these, and it is also possible that there is a fourth or a fifth option um, that nobody has thought of yet. So we are in uh, kind of an ongoing detective game. But to get back to turtles, how can we use what we are learning to help threatened species like um, sea turtles? Some behavioral studies have been done with baby sea turtles. So if you remember from the beginning, the migratory path sea turtles follow um, makes a circle across the Atlantic Ocean that aligns quite closely with the currents of the North Atlantic gyre. If you test baby sea turtles under um, recreated magnetic conditions that match those at the points here, it seems that these babies really know where they are. <laughs> so over here near Europe, um, they've gone too far away from the regular migratory route and they swim in a southerly direction that will keep them from being swept up into the Arctic uh, where they would die. And then they swim in a westerly direction that will hopefully get them back to the migration path. So turtles have what we might call a magnetic map, not just a magnetic compass. I mentioned earlier that using just one characteristic of Earth's magnetic field would only be enough to give a sense of direction, like a compass would tell you where north is, but not where you are standing in the forest. Using two characteristics of the magnetic field could allow an animal to know exactly where it is. 
similar to how you and I would need to have both our longitude and latitude coordinates in order to use a global positioning system. From a few more behavioral studies, we know that baby sea turtles can indeed detect two magnetic characteristics, inclination and intensity. So based on the three hypotheses we talked about, it would um, seem likely that they use either a uh, both a radical pair and an induction mechanism. But sea turtles don't have an electrosensory system in their skin like sharks do, at least not that we know of. <laughs> Exciting recent work on pigeons indicates that an induction mechanism might be possible in the canals of the ear, which are filled with liquid. And you'll notice that these canals have a similar loop-like shape to the induction diagram that I showed you earlier. So it sounds like studying magnetoreception in birds might be helpful for thinking about turtles, at least to some extent. Maybe it could be useful for informing conservation efforts because studies in the lab show that birds can no longer orient using the magnetic field in the presence of electromagnetic noise. That kind of noise is produced by electronic devices made by us humans. So it's hard to predict what such an interference would look like in the real world outside of the lab, but lots of man-made machinery is already being used in the oceans. And if sea turtles are using similar mechanisms, or magnetoreception to what birds are using, this is worth looking into. So with that, uh, I really hope that this has piqued your interest. <laughs> Earth's magnetic field is everywhere and it goes through most materials, which makes it a fantastic cue for navigation. Animals can either use it for a compass or a map sense, depending on how many characteristics of the magnetic field they can perceive. And we know that so many different kinds of animals are in fact capable of magnetoreception. Not just the animals we talked about, insects and bony fish um, have also been researched. So I encourage you to look them up as well. And today I have been presenting other people's research, um, but for anybody who is interested, my project will look at what regions of the brain um, in mole rats respond to magnetic information, which will hopefully lead us to the receptor cells responsible for detecting magnetic fields. Um, still nobody has been able to find those in any animal. So feel free to visit our lab website and you are welcome to contact me if you come up with questions after today. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Martha. It was very interesting. <laughs> I didn't know that there were so many animals that were using this. I mean, I heard about birds, maybe about sharks as well, but red moles. Um, never heard about them using that, but anyway. Um, before we go actually to the questions, so just to leave also the audience time to maybe ask some questions. Um, also, and also for those that watch this afterwards, you can also always post comments below as well, so we can then forward them and get an answer even after the live session. But before we go on, I just wanted to share with you our uh, talk from next week, which is by Franziska Tell. So this is going to be in German again. Um, and she will talk about um, carbon in the ocean and the role of small animals in a huge uh, circle of or yeah, circular uh, pattern of CO2 absorption and release in the ocean, in the global oceans. So in German, um, Kohlenstoff im Ozean, die Rolle von kleinen Lebewesen in einem großen Kreislauf. And she's from Marum in Bremen, uh, doing her PhD thesis on this topic. But now um, let's go to the questions. Um, one question I had, oh, there is actually one that came just in from, from the chat, so I should ask that first. Um, so Supermommel asked, are there changes in the roots of migratory animals due to changes of the Earth's magnetic field? That is a very good question. <laughs> um, probably. I have not uh, researched that myself at all, but it depends on, it would depend on how, how much of a change there is probably. So there are daily changes in the magnetic field, kind of on the range of tens of nanotesla. And, um, 
that shouldn't really impact animals as much. But over time, as the field changes, it's quite possible that animals will have to adapt um, that. Thank you. And thank you so much for the talk. Really fantastic and exciting research going on there. And I'm really jealous, right? I have a so such bad orientation that I would love <laughs> such a <laughs> sense, right? That you exactly know where you are, like <laughs> what a longitude latitude. That would be great. Um, I'm of course, and Matthias also interested in bacteria, right? So do you know why they are attracted or uh, like why why magnetism is kind of an attractor for them? Yeah, um, they use it so they're. They are anoxic um, bacteria. They want to avoid oxygen. And they use it kind of as a, a vertical cue in the soil um, to know if they are too close <laughs> to the surface or not, for the most part. Yeah. They're also in the ocean, by the way. Those were freshwater bacteria, but there are salt water as well. Yeah, many thanks also for me. Um, like such a nice range of organisms from bacteria to sharks, uh, sharks, which is uh, really nice. Um, so there was another question in the chat by Livia Oliveira, and uh, she's asking uh, if there are impact studies where electromagnetic noise is assessed. So if like other disturbances are considered, is it also like true for electromagnetic noise? Uh, yes. Um, so an example of that would be like solar storms, for example. And um, I can actually, I have a few, I think supplementary slides that might be useful here. <laughs> um, let me get to them first. <laughs> Sorry, ah, there we go. Yeah, so some environmental sources of, um, noise are like atmospheric so from thunderstorms for example and um, there's the anthropogenic noise that i talked about but then there's also solar storm noise and the oh that's sorry no. so the <laughs> there have been studies in birds at specific um frequencies also in other animals, but mostly birds, of specific frequencies of this noise that can disturb the animals, um, as well as kind of a broad range of noises. And it turns out that um, most of this noise falls in the range that has disturbed birds as well. So it's... <laughs> It's still important to find the upper and lower boundary of what kind of frequency would impact these animals, but it is known that it, it happens. Um, I think things like power lines, not so much, but um, other machinery like in the lab as well um, can have an effect. Does that answer the question? <laughs> Yeah, many thanks. Maybe you can unshare again. Then oh, can... yes, sorry. <laughs> I just also wanted to um, give some compliments from the chat. So there was quite a bit of um, thank you, great talk, um, interesting talk, nice lecture, compliments from the chat. Um, one question that just came up, well, actually there are now two from Constantine. Um, so let me just ask the first one. What happens when there isn't any magnetic force? And uh, here he says, uh, like on Mars, how do they orientate them then? Uh, great question. For, I mean, in the context of an animal, it's, we all have multiple senses, right? So if you shut down one, it's possible that an animal can fall back on another one. Um, and it, it could be also that they pay more attention to one than the other. Um, which is why during a magnetic experiment, you're trying to control for everything else so that only the magnetic field is what they're paying attention to. Um, so I guess it kind of depends on the animal, what would happen. <laughs> um, so in some cases, uh, the 
the orientation will become more random um, and others, yeah, depending on the task, I might just sit there and not do anything. So. <laughs> Actually, the, the next one I can also from Constantine, I can ask after that, right, as well, because I was also also wondering that um, have there been tests how strong the magnetic field has, has to be for these animals to actually spot it? I mean, like the intensity that you named as one of the, as the factors? Yep. Um, there, oh dear, I don't have the greatest head for numbers, so the specifics I, I don't have right now, but I know the Earth's magnetic field is around... Um, I think 50 nanotesla maximum, uh, that's at the higher end. So you, in testing, you, you really want to keep um, it, that range <laughs> kind of close because, so if you have a magnetite mechanism, for example, and if it's a chain, then you have what's called a permanent dipole moment um, so that the charge distribution allows for that polarity. If the intensity gets too high, that can kind of destroy that um, charge distribution, which um, could even maybe cause a, a flip or something. So the animal won't be able to use its magnetoreceptor anymore. Um, not so cool for the animal, <laughs> but that is also one of the uh, things that's been suggested as a way to test for magnetite versus induction hypothesis. So there, there's kind of a, a maximum at some point. I'm not sure where it is, but it shouldn't get too high or the animal will be able to use it anymore. And a minimum as well? And that I'm not so sure about, probably. <laughs> yeah, probably. Well, yes. And um, you said you're working with now uh, really like brains, right? <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit what, what you are doing, maybe? Sure. Let me share my screen again if that's right. <laughs> Backtracking this time. Yep. Um, so I kind of alluded to what sensory reception is already. And what I do really relies heavily on the connection between receptor and brain. So um, all senses require a receptor, like your eye um, has photoreceptors, your tongue has its um, oh dear, call them taste buds, <laughs> and you have hair cells in your ear for hearing. So for example, an eye is connected to visual regions of the brain. And that means that if I can figure out what regions of the brain are involved in magnetoreception, I should be able to trace the paths of nerves um, to where the receptor should be. Uh, so that's basically what I'm interested in. And what that kind of experiment would look like is first, a behavioral experiment similar to what I showed you before. So a natural magnetic field versus maybe a rotated polarity field. And then um, I would look for differences in the brain, usually in the form of proteins that are expressed when there's a change in the environment to see if maybe this condition has more proteins than this one in specific parts of the brain. Um, don't get too overwhelmed by this picture. <laughs> it's just an example from a study that uses the same methodology that I um, will be using. They came up with this analysis actually. And um, in this case, they tested mice that were shaved, so didn't have whiskers, and mice that had whiskers, um, placing them also in an arena to just explore their surroundings. And in, in this, um, column, you can nicely see that the CFOS protein, which these little black dots represent, um, shows up more in, in this particular region of the brain than um, in the other whiskerless animals. So that then you can analyze, come up with heat maps <laughs> to make it easier to tell um, where the regions are, and then do 
a statistical analysis. Um, so that, that will be the first part of my, um, my own work. And later I'll be tracing nerves to see how that's connected to somewhere else in the body. <laughs> okay, um, very interesting. Good luck with it, your research. Um, even though you have to shave some mice, that's, that's really, oh, these poor guys. <laughs> um, so just another question from the chat, just in the last minute, um, is there a possibility that human activities can influence the Earth magnetic field on a global scale? On a global scale? Well, also, or local, well, whatever, can they change? <laughs> yeah, um, locally, definitely. Yep, that's possible. Um, Probably, so going back to that electromagnetic noise I talked about, where there are more people, there's going to be more of that noise. So a big city, if a bird is flying past it, there's a, a greater potential that it would get confused by human noise um, kind of masking the, the magnetic field that would be there otherwise. Um, that's the best example I can think of. I think. Uh, yeah, I'll stick with that. <laughs> okay, I think, um, I don't know, I think we have all the questions from the chat and we're about time. I don't know, is there anything, I think, did you have another question, Matthias, that you wanted to ask? Oh, well, yeah. I have many questions, but I think you do. Yeah. No, because you wrote something here uh, that you that you yeah. might have a question. So maybe let's do that one and then we finish after that. Oh, well, I was just because I'm a diver also myself. And I'm, of course, curious about that, about the sharks, you know. And uh, like, I was just wondering, like, do you have to kind of um, anesthetate them to kind of put these magnets on these animals, for example? And a bit related to that, I mean, as far as I know, they have these... Um, Electromagnetic organs. Well, you explained it right in the, in the in the head, and then you can actually, if you touch them there, they can also get a little bit dizzy, and you can actually kind of put them to sleep if you put uh, if you touch them there. So these kind of two things I was wondering about. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I can't really remember if they did that in that particular study, um, or maybe if they somehow habituated the sharks to humans um, in a way that would allow them more contact. But yeah, I think if it's a wild shark or a semi-wild shark, you probably would want to anesthetize it. Thanks. Okay, great. And I think, um, yeah, there was another thank you in the chat, but otherwise I think we had a very good talk here and um, thanks a lot for all this information of how to navigate when you're a bird or a, a shark or, or a red mole. Um, and we'll see you next week. If you have any comments, if you have any questions, put them below the video and we will forward them to Martha. Otherwise, um, we will see you next week and we wish you a very good night. Good evening. Bye.